Welcome to this podcast of the Florida Historical Quarterly. My name is Daniel Murphy, and I am assistant editor of the journal. If you are new to these podcasts, please visit the Florida Historical Quarterly on Facebook, where you can now access abstracts of each article in the current issue of the journal. Today's podcast features an interview with Dr. Jane Landers, the Gertrude Conaway Vanderbilt Professor of History at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. She is the author, editor, or co-editor of seven books, including Atlantic Creoles in the Age of Revolutions and Black Society in Spanish Florida. In today's interview, Dr. Landers and I discussed the content of the special issue on 17th century Florida that she recently guest edited for the FHQ. The first question I asked Dr. Landers was about her vision for the special issue on the 17th century. Uh, well, yes. When you all asked me to do the editing, and I was very honored to be asked to do that, um, I thought about the 17th century and what I'd been taught in graduate school and what I'd worked on since in my own work. And it can sound uh, as if it's sort of a depressing century, actually, when you think about it, because there's so many challenges uh, to Spain and the Spanish Empire and Florida. Uh, so there are many things to think about in sort of a declension narrative I mentioned in my essay. You think about the height of the empire being in the 16th century, which is covered in your first special issue, when things are, uh, you know, hopeful, everything is being discovered, great treasures and so on. But the 17th century uh, is one in which Spain was stretched too thin across a, a huge empire, and one in which it suffered many, many other problems in the metropole, including epidemics, demographic collapse, wars, uh, and also the same sorts of problems on the other side of the Atlantic and its empire, where Indian populations that had once seemed you know, endless were dying due to diseases that were introduced by the Europeans. Uh, where civilizations were sort of falling apart, labor systems were falling apart, and all of that meant declining revenues for Spain, especially in their uh, silver mines on which they depended so heavily in Peru and in New Spain or Mexico. And all of that made it seem as if Spain was, uh, you know, soon to lose all of its empire, including Florida and rising were the English powers and French powers in the Atlantic world. Both of them were trying to, uh, you know, take little chunks of the territory once claimed by Spain. And so piracy and raids by the English, the Dutch, and the French were ongoing problems for the whole Caribbean, including Florida. So it sounds like a pretty dire picture. And yet uh, I wanted also to show that Spanish Florida, uh, although it was under such pressure and so many challenges, was able to survive against all odds almost. Uh, and so every time pirates raided, uh, people rebuilt their lives. Every time the city was burned or disease struck, they rebuilt again. And uh, through it all, then, I think we can take out a, a, a message of some hope that people, you know, have the will to survive and to stay, you know, where they had created their homes. Um, and one of the important things about the 17th century is that Spain did hold Florida, uh, despite the pressures of the English who had come in to the north in, in what became South Carolina, and the French who were coming in from the west. Uh, each of those uh, great powers would have liked to have had total control of Florida and yet Spain was able to keep it. So that's, I think, the picture that I wanted to get across for the 17th century. And the essays that I uh, invited, I think, speak to all those issues. Well, speaking of those essays, who were the contributors and uh, what, what did they focus on? Okay. Well, um, first, I, I also wanted to thank <laughs> you, Dan, and Connie, uh, both for inviting me to do this issue and also for all the help and support you've given me in producing it. And I'm also indebted to Paul Hoffman, who did such a wonderful uh, wonderful job on the 16th century special issue. So that was a model for me, and uh, I had uh, a great idea from that what I wanted to do with my own. And so I looked for the people and the authors that I'd engaged with really ever since my graduate school uh, 
at Florida, and it turned out that many of the people that were working on the 17th century uh, were people who either went to school with me or subsequently graduated from the University of Florida. And so in this special issue, we have Susan Parker, who's the executive director uh, of the St. Augustine Historical Society. Susan uh, graduated with me from the University of Florida. She has worked on the Historic St. Augustine Preservation Board and consulted on many historic and archaeological projects um, and has done a wonderful job as an editor herself on El Escribano and Tampa Bay history, among others. So Susan uh, is somebody who did a wonderful dissertation, which is as yet unpublished on the 17th century life in St. Augustine. Bonnie McEwen, uh, who's with the Florida Bureau of Archaeology, she was the director of archaeology and the executive director at Mission San Luis for many, many years and did a wonderful job uh, in the archaeology itself of that place, but also in fundraising to make it the wonderful site it is today. And so she's been acknowledged at the White House even for that work of preservation. And Bonnie has edited several important books on historical archaeology and ethnohistory in Florida, on the missions at Florida, and with uh, our dear departed friend John Hahn, the Appalachian Indians and Mission San Luis. Bonnie, I was the obvious person to ask to work on the archaeology of the 17th century and on the missions. Um, and then Amy Turner Bushnell, who preceded me at the University of Florida and was so kind and supportive to me as I was coming through my career, um, is an associate professor of history at Brown University, an invited research scholar also at the John Carter Brown Library. And uh, her work was directed also by my own director, Lyle McAllister, at the University of Florida. So. It's sort of an incestuous network here. <laughs> but she published one on Florida's economy and its development in the 17th century, Situado en Sabana, Spain, the System for the Presidio and Mission Provinces, was one important book she published, and before that, King's Coffer. So I asked uh, Amy also to talk about the Republic of Indians in Florida and the uh, way Spain supported, sometimes not so well, the Spanish mission systems and the larger community of Spaniards. And then a, a new young scholar, Diana Regelsberger, uh, who also graduated from the University of Florida way past my time, but um, she's now teaching Latin American Studies at Flagler College and uh, worked under Ida Altman, who is a famed colonial historian of the Caribbean. So uh, I asked Diana what she would like to do in this issue, and she has addressed the issue of piracy, which was one of the main challenges uh, Florida faced in the 17th century. So those are my authors, and uh, I just noticed, as I said this to you, that they're all women, so <laughs> I'm, I apologize for leaving the men out. <laughs> well, I was going to say, I mean, you've, you've got... I mean, an impressive array of scholars, to say the least. I mean, just hearing you talk about them is even more impressive than kind of just seeing their work. It's it's amazing. Well, good. Yes, I think they're all wonderful, and uh, I certainly didn't mean to slight the men, but we can be proud that Florida has offered uh, such support to strong women scholars. I think that's rather rare, actually. Yeah, hopefully it's a trendsetter in a lot of ways. Let's hope. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, so you've talked a little bit about the uh, the contributors. Um, mm -hmm. I'll just ask you a broader question: are are there okay. any are there any specific events or movements or peoples in 17th century Florida that stand out for their regional or wider impact and an Atlantic world impact or hemispheric impact? Well, I think so. You know, uh, Florida really had no large Indian populations uh, to brag about as. Uh, the new Spanish colony did or the Peruvian colony did. Uh, so we didn't have that. We didn't have a lot of mineral wealth. We had no gold mines or silver mines or emeralds to, to brag about. But what we had was a tremendous location. And um, we sit on the Atlantic with that long coastline. Uh, we jut out into the Caribbean. Uh, we're headed, uh, I, I sort of consider it almost a suburb of Cuba in this period. And the silver fleets had to pass right by us. Uh, so this resulted in 
the wonderful 17th century construction of the Castillo de San Marcos. And just that construction alone marks this as an important place and an important time uh, because Spain invested huge amounts of resources in, in building that as they did many of the other important fortifications around the Circum-Caribbean in Havana and Puerto Rico and Cartagena. Uh, so it, it signifies how important Florida was for Spain and the empire in general. And although there were some early debates about whether or not to give it up, uh, Spain decided in the long run they needed to keep it for those geopolitical reasons that I just mentioned. And uh, so it's very significant in the broader picture, um, although we did not have the great, uh, you know, imperial structures that the Inca and the Aztec built. We did have location, and it was critical to the larger picture of the Spanish Empire. So. Building that was something that's really critical. Uh, before that, I think we saw many, uh, many ways in which Florida was so vulnerable to raids and pirate attacks. So uh, in the 16th century, we suffered from Francis Drake's terrible raids. In the 17th century, there are a whole series of these as well, uh, where uh, the people are suffered under great you know, sort of a tax that the people are killed, buildings are burned, uh, populations are dispersed, everybody has to rebuild. And it's, a, it's something to note that that was still worth keeping in all of that damage. So I think in the larger picture, Florida may not look as glamorous, but it is uh, geopolitically critical and especially once the uh, French and the English start having designs on the, on the region. So uh, in the Caribbean in general, uh, we, we think of ourselves as part of an extension of the Spanish Caribbean, especially of Cuba, as I mentioned. And much of the political structure is located in Cuba. The military support is there. The finances come from uh, New Spain or Mexico and uh, the fleets circle all of those ports and hit St. Augustine as well. So we're totally integrated into a broader world that we have to remember. And then the English start to come into our, our view when they established Charleston in 1670. And uh, there's a, a quote that says it's only 10 days journey to St. Augustine. So having the English in what was once considered all Spanish territory is a tremendous challenge. And Spain and St. Augustine rise to the occasion and try to to eject them from what was their claim. Uh, they're not able to do that, but they are able to hold Florida against uh, many raids from the English. And they are also able to hold Florida in the West from the French who would like to take it as well. So I think um, all of those raids, every one of those attacks was a possible moment in which Florida could have been lost and yet uh, in a very small place with very few resources, the Spaniards hang on against those other empires. So I think that's uh, one of the things that we need to remember that it's part of a bigger, broader imperial struggle. Hmm. And I, I think the, the issue really does kind of illustrate that. Um, it was, I guess my last question then would be, for, for people especially that don't know a lot about 17th century Florida, mm -hmm. what, what would you tell them are the enduring legacies? How, how should we regard the region, the period today? Oh, that's, that's really sort of hard to say. You know, I think the 17th century gets overlooked sometimes, as I said, because the drama is in the first discoveries and the first everythings. Um, and the 18th century, uh, Spain is, is even further into uh, decline. We, we actually lose Florida at one point to the British, and then we regain it for another short period. But the 17th century, we might consider the long 17th century, I think its legacy is persistence, really, in the face of all the challenges. If if we think of it in sort of an ahistorical way, had England been able to take Florida in the 1670s, um, you know, how might history have been different, not just for Florida, but for the larger Caribbean world? 
England did take Jamaica in 1655, and we see a whole different trajectory for that space after the English takeover. There would have been a, a complete change of the legal system, a complete change of the religious and social and cultural systems, of the language. Everything would have been quite different if uh, Spain had not clung tenaciously onto that little uh, territory. So. So, so it would definitely be a different Florida today. <laughs> it would definitely be a different one. And as you wrote about the French, had they uh, also been more successful in, in moving eastward and taking over the whole peninsula, then we would have had a different system altogether and a different language and a different culture. And um, I think m we did tremendous damage by uh, actually colonizing Florida to the indigenous populations uh, inadvertently through disease, but sometimes through warfare. And uh, I think that's a legacy uh, that we need to acknowledge, and uh, we need to do our best to recover the lost history and the lost archaeology of the Indian populations we no longer know. So I think that's another important part of the 17th century story. Well, is there anything else you'd like um, the potential readers to know about this special issue? I'm just heartened that there's so much interest in Florida history and that UCF and the Florida Historical Quarterly have done such a wonderful job of keeping it alive. Uh, I think as our, our demographics in our own nation shift and we have such a growing and important Hispanic population across the whole southern tier and beyond, that more and more people will be interested in Florida history, I hope, and um, I think these special issues will make a, a, a great resource for people who may have moved into the state and don't know it as well. Uh, and I'm heartened by all the interest of the historical societies and the museums, and uh, I think that we we have a great support group, and I hope everybody will continue to support us. Well, uh, Jane, I, I really appreciate you, you talking to me today, and I'm, I'm very you, appreciative of your uh, your work on the special issue. I think it's it's a really great work, and it's going to have a, a long life, long shelf life. I hope so. <laughs> Thanks so much for inviting me to do it and for helping me through it. Thank you for joining our international audience for this podcast of the Florida Historical Quarterly. The Florida Historical Quarterly is the peer-reviewed scholarly journal of the Florida Historical Society. The Society was founded in 1856 and is the only statewide historical organization in the state of Florida. The Society is headquartered in Cocoa, Florida, and the editorial offices of the journal are in the Department of History at the University of Central Florida. I hope you have enjoyed the Florida Historical Quarterly podcast and that you will consider supporting future scholarship on Florida history by becoming a member of the Florida Historical Society. In recognition of the quincentennial of Ponce de Leon's first visit to Florida in 1513, the FHQ is publishing a series of six special issues, each devoted to examining Florida over the previous five centuries. We look forward to receiving your feedback on these special issues and other future volumes as well. We also invite researchers to access back issues of the Florida Historical Quarterly on JSTOR. Thank you again for listening to the Florida Historical Quarterly podcast. If you enjoy listening to this interview and know of others who enjoy history, please tell them about the podcast and have them find us on Facebook. <laughs>